Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. So this is another story from the Paladin DM that also goes by Lord Althory. If you like his work you should check out his subscribe star to support him directly or check out his YouTube channel linked to down below. And with that out of the way let's get into the story. I am the bard, who knows too well how little time we have. Even the elves do not have enough, and the gods also mourn for the passing of days. The next several weeks were a flurry of activity as the Ordanic army made ready for the crusade upon St. Jonas. Armor was forged and weapons were ready, but the damage and where all had suffered in the intense battle upon the beaches would need to be repaired. They had taken up the arms and armor of the ancient Duariga, but to say such aged equipment required an uncomfortable amount of maintenance would be an understatement. With the threat of Ilatum removed, the time had come to fully restore and, in many cases, utterly reforged the equipment the army had taken from the ancient hold. Suits of armor were taken and melted down to be forged anew. Weapons were not merely sharpened, they were remade as grand as when they had first left the anvil. Hammers rouse and fell in rhythm as the smiths of every tribe and tongue forged together. Dwarven care and craftsmanship alongside the mechanical precision of legionary mass production, Human experimental techniques from a dozen nations tempered by ancient and tried methods of the rare elven smith. Kazdor and his master smith Grungai carefully managed their workshops with all the justice and wisdom of a king worthy of his crown. Each was given tasks according to their skill, and while many dwarves grumbled at the elven smiths working alongside them, they could not deny the skill of their long-eared colleagues. And so, the hammers rouse and fell, each in their own timing according to that which they forged. Even Gazdor himself shed his panoply and took up his smith's hammer with delight, adding to the effort. As the ringing of steel resounded through the hall, the sound of forging songs could be heard, as was the tradition of the smiths. Here is one such song, though it was sung in Dvavish and so does not translate exactly, and I am a bard for stories and not for songs, but this is roughly how it went. There once was a smith named Dorvi, who lived in Kazdmoor. I know you've never heard of him, but that's because that hold is far. Hammers were his craft, so hammers he made. Only and ever, all of his days. The king came to Orvi, said make me a sword. Orvi made a hammer that would break his sword. An elf came to Orvi said make me a bow. Orvi made a hammer light enough to throw. Of Adamant the first and of Mitchell the last. Both scored black by the furnace's blast. A giant came along and mocked the dwarf. Your talents are as narrow as thou art short. A contest was made, and each went to forge. The giant used a dragon for his lighting torch. He tore up a mountain and poured it in then struck it with such a great and terrible din. That puller looked down and covered his ears. And Orvi went deaf for ten dozen years. Then he pulled out a sword as long as he. He swung it once, and cut the breeze. To topple a tower in a far off land, which crushed the Pasha of Kadishman. Orvi made a hammer, simple and plain. It was for himself, and he wasn't vain. Then the giant swung down, and Orvi met his blow. And the thunder rolled out, but Orvi didn't know. And then there came a splintering crack. For the giant's sword broke, and went flying back. And the giant died, and then fell forward. Impaled by the shards of his own shoddy sword. And so, they sang as the worked. As this took up a good deal of Kinker's door's time, Senkit stepped in to continue handling administration as she had at the Abbey. She governed fairly, but sternly, admonishing many, no matter their race or station. As the only tiffling aside from Cain in the colony, she was somewhat set apart from any racial dispute. As for her authority, 
the whole colony already respected the abbess for her wisdom and valor, and few doubted. Those few that did, mostly of the Dwarven contingent, had their grumbling silenced when they recalled that she was the Queen of Drake in feasting in all but name, and if not for the concerns of politics inherent to any nobility, Castor would have given her his name. Despite this, she continued to act only as his representative. Though by all right she had the right to sit upon the throne herself as regent, she stood beside it, as with any trusted counselor. However, nobody who saw the two together could buy the pretense for long. Among the more refined, their unequitable affection became a symbol of chaste virtue and the proper manner of courtly love in tasteful and holy moderation. Among the less refined, particularly the goblins, lewd stories began to circulate instead. Meanwhile, Julian and Andrea applied all their knowledge of the chemical and the arcane to determine the composition of the blasting powder, for until now they had been using the stores of it and the old weapons, without really understanding how to make more or use it effectively. Upon a rather thorough chemical analysis, they were shocked to find it was completely different to the usual blasting powder. The usual, highly unstable substance known as blasting powder was made by combining glycerine and an acid, and then adding the unstable explosive into sawdust to stabilize it into a vaguely usable form. However, this black blasting powder was in fact comprised primarily of charcoal, sulfur, and saltpeter. Rather than violently destabilizing to create the massive blast of blasting powder, it instead effectively burnt at an astounding rate. With this in mind, the two busied themselves with their alchemy for another full week. With the expenditure of a great deal of time, a great deal of coffee, and a great deal of healing magic to recover from faulty explosions, the two successfully managed to replicate the black powder. With that done, the next step would be to reverse engineer the weapons, which the dwarves had taken to calling Holland's Cherb, after an old term for the shards of rock that went flying when detonated by blasting powder. Window dressing, the experimental black powder unit, had been using old versions salvaged from the hold. Now, Julian set to work disassembling one and carefully noting down its design. The barrel was designed so that black powder would be poured in, followed by the metal bullet being dropped down. The black powder was ignited by a tiny fire rune at one end of the barrel. This, however, was a work of such delicate detail as to make the weapon essentially impossible to manufacture except by a master runesmith, and considering the rarity and detail of such a craft, the weapon would not be usable in a large army. Therefore, Julian set to work attempting to improve the firing mechanism. He initially experimented with using both traditional blasting powder and then alchemist's fire as his igniting agent, but found both to be too unstable. He found his lightning gauntlet's ambient electricity could also act to ignite the gunpowder, but that was no less rare and arcane than the fire rune ignition. After many more trials, he hit upon a solution so simple he slapped himself in the face for not realizing it. Flint. The same flint and steel that lit his basic tinderbox could also ignite the gunpowder. He quickly set to work on a prototype. Soon, the flintlight Hollenscherb was ready for testing, and to everyone's surprise, it worked, and not only worked but worked fairly reliably, igniting four out of every five shots. However, Another problem swiftly aroused to challenge the new weapon's reliability, namely the inconsistent amount of gunpowder involved. Too little and it would not fire. Too much and the weapon would explode. Shortly after reattaching his fingers, Julian set to work on fixing this issue with the sort of vigor and spite that only somebody who has blown off their own fingers can manage. He hit upon the idea of a separate black powder reservoir of such a size as to ensure the same quantity of powder every time. This could be located at the back, and filled from the side using the thin end of a hollow goat's horn as a funnel, then have the reservoir sealed with a hatch, thus directing all the explosive force down the barrel, 
Several failed prototypes and a dozen reattached fingers later, he succeeded in finding exactly the right amount of gunpowder to produce a decent, stable result. However, further problems continued to present themselves, namely the vulnerability to damp, as the powder would not ignite, or flame, as it would ignite too quickly. However, solving these current problems was beyond him for the moment, so he accepted the weapon as it was. As such, it proved to be a useful supplement, but not outright replacement, to the longer range and more reliable crossbows and long bows that still found use in most of his army. However, they were used for special weapons teams, kept in reserve to be deployed on his command. While those three handled the equipment half of logistics for the crusade, Peregrine and Farron collaborated on gathering the fodder for the army. Fish was caught and dried, the local wildlife fled for the amount of hunting being undertaken and clearing began for new farms. Eort on the other hand took command of Ricone, riding out alongside the elven scouts and his own few mentarii to study the way to the city, even going so far as to travel to the hills around Zan Jonas and their update Andre's map. When he returned, Kazdor took it and went to the Pool of Kings, using its powers to scry the city and complete the map in full. Then it was taken to the Great War Room and there Julian and the Ort discussed strategy in further detail. As further information dawned though, it became clear that this would be a most challenging campaign. The Paladins had supposed that they had broken the power of the Gnolls and Orcs when they had departed the city, slaying many of their number and also their leaders. Unfortunately, such was not the case. During their time in the city, which was now almost a full year ago, they had slain some 300 Gnolls and roughly 100 Orcs, in addition to the leadership of each. While this had indeed been a mighty feat for so few, it only bloodied the noses of both forces. There were now easily 2,000 gnolls and an equal number of orcs in the city. There would have been even more, but the deaths of their leaders had unleashed a bitter power struggle. The paladins had destroyed the elites, but the soldiers remained, and the resulting power struggle had forged new leaders, each bloodied by the vicious civil war that had gained them their thrones. These would be veteran troops, the same as before. To make matters even worse, Elatham's shadow still hung over the land, and while he had been destroyed, the few weeks he walked the land were bad enough. A living rift into the abyss is not exactly good for the neighborhood, unless you happen to be a demon. This combined with the Knoll's own attempts to call forth the direct servants of their dark gods had led to a massive spike in chaotic energy. The grand pillar at the heart of the Knoll camp poured out chaos energy over the whole city, and demons walked openly in the streets. But there were not only the servants of the hyena god to deal with, for the corruption had even seeped into the orcs, as reports came back of massive, bestial orcs with the horns of demons and abyssal chitin. Tanaruk had come to San Jonas, and the savage sons of Grumsh were driven into an even greater blood fury. And then there were the dead. A year of constant bloodshed, combined with the slaughter of the nearby elven city at the hands of Elatum and then the death of his army had gorged the blight at the heart of the city. A full third of which was now enwrapped in the blight tendrils emerging from the graveyard. Any dead that fell were dragged back to that dark place and infested, used as puppets for the growing shadow, such that they were able to fight both Orc and Nol at once. But, the Paladins had three advantages. One, their troops were superior in their training, in their morale, in their equipment, and their versatility, meaning they wielded a smaller yet more elite force. Two, they had all the time in the world to plan. Three, they had the War Master, who would take that time, and devote all his prodigious intellect and talent for battle into it. If war be an art, then this was Julian's magnum opus. The plan was set in excruciating detail, with contingency within contingency. The army changed again, and the nature of that change will be detailed when the time comes for the execution of the plan, and for another three months they trained and retrained, 
each drilling their specific duty into their head. The Black Lions underwent the excruciating task of memorizing it in full, for they would have to serve as commanders, at least for the middle part of the battle. For once again, as the battle raged around them, the Paladins would plunge once more into darkness to tear out its heart. No matter the cost. I am the Bard, who has seen a great evil under the sun, that men hunger for what is eternal and yet cannot reach it, for they are mortal, and they pass away like vapor. It came to pass during the course of the preparations for the march on San Jonas that Yort's scouts began reporting certain signs. The signs of the passing of hobgoblins, in legion force. It was clear that a new warlord was on the march and moving to gather together the goblinoids to make another attempt upon the great city. Faced with this knowledge, Eort set out immediately, with Peregrine accompanying him. If they could convince this new legion to join them, the boon to their forces would be terrific. If they failed though, the pair would need to decapitate the leadership before the enemy forces in San Jonas increased even further. So, the older halfling and the young legate rode out together, traveling swiftly by hidden paths and secret ways to intercept the new legion. The first night, they made camp in a secluded oaken glade, resting in the shadows where the light of the full moon danced between the leaves. The stars also lit the night, and the deep blue of the heavens danced between the leaves, twinkling almost as a star of stars itself among the black. They lit no fire, for they meant to travel without arousing unneeded attention. Even still, neither wolf nor bear dared trouble the two travelers. Beasts have a certain sense for the mighty, and an instinct for what is deadly to draw near. Men possess it as well, but ours is less developed, for we have words to speak with, and not merely aura. That, and the literal nightmare with no skin and a skull for a face that was sleeping nearby also probably helped. I don't care how dull your senses are, you do not trifle with a monster like that without a very good reason. Despite the lack of fire, the two were not overly uncomfortable. The eternal summer's night was warm as ever, and both the Oort and Peregrine were accustomed to sleeping in the shelter of leaves upon beds of grass and earth. They also ate well. Peregrine had prepared for them chewy vigils, which they sliced open and filled with salted pork and hard cheese, and then had a hearty and fortifying sandwich. To wash it down, the Oort had brought both water and a canteen of cranberry cordial. Peregrine also produced a warm fish soup that had kept its heat in a certain vessel one of the human smiths had created. And for desert, Eort removed the cap on his walking stick, and then released several of the candied chestnuts he kept therein. The two friends ate heartily, Eort resting in a hollow where the roots of a great oak spread out, and Peregrine laying atop a low-hanging tree branch. The later produced his pipe, filled the dragon's mouth with the pipe weed, and then struck it lit. If we're to be found by pipe smoke, then we would have been found anyways. He said with a certain gruffness that those beginning to grow old sometimes possess. He took a deep breath and blew out two smoke rings, one from each nostril. HM, I suppose so. I'm surprised you still have any of that stuff left. I don't smoke often. Tonight simply seemed a good night for it, and besides, with the sailways south open again, I imagine it shan't be long until we start importing some more. HM, I suppose it might also grow well here. Thinking of setting up a farm? Goodness knows this adventuring business doesn't pay as well as the stories say it does. We are hardly a regular party, but yes I do think I might set up a little leaf farm and a nice properly large garden, buy a decently sized house, big enough for company and small enough to be cozy. Perhaps up north of the city where we haven't been yet. Not fond of cities? Been in too many to be fond of them. Too much noise, too much hustle and bustle. Plenty of interesting things and excitement. But I do believe when this is all done that I should like a little less excitement in my old age. Why go into the north then? To keep an eye on it of course, Cousin Farron watch the west, Senk at the south, Julian the center, 
and Andri and her folk were going to the east and rebuild that city one day. Where will you and your folk go? At this statement Eort's countenance turned sour, and his eyes were downcast and filled with great concern. To the hill around St. Jonas. He answered after a bit too long of a moment, though this thought was clearly not foremost in his mind. The hills there will make a fine place to grow grapes and olives, and the valleys between are filled with fish and good land for other produce. Peregrine sensed his comrade's disquiet and raised an eyebrow. A fair answer, and it will be a fine thing to see the hills all covered in orchards and trellises, but something troubles you. Tell me, I meant no ill by my question. Eort was silent for a long while, but Peregrine did not press him. The hobgoblin gathered together his thoughts, and thus he answered, Where shall my people go? And to whom shall the sons of order gather? We have forsaken the God of our forefathers, for he has forsaken us. Never again shall we be his slaves. What shall we do then? Shall we remain godless, to fall under the sway of clever men and purest reason? What shall men do before the gods? There is no security in men, for man is flesh, and all that comes from him shall rot. And the wrath of the conqueror shall surely be against us. But what god shall we turn to? We too are flesh, Primus will not have us. What lord in heaven shall look kindly upon the sons of darkness? Will I go to the elves, whom we have been at enmity with for all time? Will we return to the ancient gods of the Tritons, as we did before the conqueror and before our empire? Will we go to the dragons, and shelter beneath their wings? Or can I return to the depths, to Leviathan and the forgotten and terrible things that were before even dragons roamed? Shall we descend into deeper darkness, to the gods of all things done in secret? Shall we be like faceless Lamra and become changelings? Or shall we take counsel with thieves and criminals under the gaze of Mask? Will we follow after Vecna, and pursue all that which is kept secret and undermine every law? Nay, better that we had remained slaves than descended into that pit. At least then we had honor. Where is the God who is just and who justifies? Where is the King who is worthy? Who will be the ally of traitors, the defender of the guilty, and the friend of sinners? Who is the mighty God who will stand against the conqueror for the sake of traitors and escaped slaves? Where is the God of righteousness and redemption alike? Perfect in might and mercy and bold to stand for sinners? I cannot say. If there is such a God, he must be too high for this world, too great and too holy. An unknown God who is too pure for even form, and so the one thing that might be for us is too far away to take note. Tell me then, Peregrine, where is the God of Eort and his people? All these things Eort poured out before his friend, with all the sorrow and consternation, for he had long chewed this bitter root and found no answer to his worry. Peregrine sat and listened with all attention and care, then was silent for a long while, blowing smoke from his pipe as he considered his answer. Consider all that has been since the dawning of stories. I say of stories, for we know of stories and histories, but know not from where all things stem. But this we know, all things have begun, and all things that begin shall end. In ages past, the primordials reigned, and then they passed away when the gods arose. They were slain and slew in turn, and even the mightiest, Io, god of dragons, passed away. Under the gods, many things have come and gone, first the Illiturds, and then the dragons, and then the men of Nethril, and then also the Tritons and Elves, and from there your own people's great empire, which came to an end some four hundred years ago and has left us in this age of chaos without a great empire. All these things come and go, as momentary as my pipe smoke. What then remains? What is constant and eternal? Even the earth shifts, and the heavens bend and weave at the whims of the gods. Even the sun, if certain savages from the south are to be believed, is changing, for Pula is according to them but the fifth in a succession of gods to hold the mantle. Is there nothing constant? No, 
that is, for truly, truly I tell you, this I have seen as I have sojourned across the world of mortals. In every age, in every kingdom, in each race, each tribe, each language, there is that which is written on the hearts of men. To know good and evil and for the two to be at war within all people. Yea, even the gods are not beyond this, for each one stands in his own place in the great conflict. Some make a good of themselves, such as your own creator and Grumsh, and because of this the two are constantly at enmity with one another. But others, even the best, echo this fundamental goodness, as shadows and examples of the perfect, transcendent goodness which inhabits all things. So, take heart, my young friend, and dwell upon these things. What shall your people do? Follow the law which is written upon your heart, and what even the creation of a wicked god cannot erase. And this law is summed up in one word, to love one another. From this, all good deeds shall spring, and from its corruption and lack all wickedness is produced. Yort listened closely to all these things and then chuckled slightly. That's it? Something so simple. Peregrine smiled in response. Of course, the foundation of a house is only a stone, it's not particularly complicated, but without that simple stone the whole structure collapses. We're talking about the foundation for everything that is, the marrow and most fundamental structure of the world. We don't think on it any more than we think on air or a fish thinks on water. It's only something we take note of when it's going wrong. I have my doubts on just how sturdy the foundation is. If good is at the heart of everything as you say, then why are you and I needed? We both fight too much evil to believe that. Why is a creature like Elaitham allowed to exist then? And how is this fundamental foundation to shield my people from the wrath of the rather vengeful bastard in the sky I just decided to annoy? Have faith the ought. Evil, chaos, these are transitory things, they come and go, for they are inherently self-destructive. Even if they seem to triumph for a time, they are only like dirt on the surface of a painting and are gone with a strong wind. Good and order though, these things are the foundations of the world, and are graven into all mortals. Kingdoms come and go, gods come and go, perhaps even the sun comes and goes, but good and order abide, and to these are the victory. Yort stared at the diminutive fellow with a look of utter astonishment. Thanks to his blessing of dark vision, he could see Peregrine's face clearly. There was no jest. No mockery, no malice or trick. There was only a simple acceptance of things, as surely as gravity. Eeyore chuckled, encouraged by his friend's simple faith even in light of a very complicated and confusing world. What will I say to the Legion then? Even you don't think we're going to just switch to enjoying a nice, tranquil life farming pipe weed and mushrooms? Of course not. Peregrine said, smiling at the thought. Your people have too much fire in them for that. You are too full of life and too short of it all at once, and so like men you find yourself constantly doing things, but even then, you want peace. Tell them of the hills covered in trellises, of the grape vines and of the olive orchards and of the beautiful villas covering the hills and dotted among the aspens. Promise them the smell of industry, the sound of stone being lifted, and the great city being rebuilt. Promise them a day when they can come home from a campaign and build cities rather than burn them. Promise them a day when their sons may march to war only for a good and right cause. Your people are the sons of order are they not? War is chaos, so tell them that. Offer them peace and a future. Every creature wants that even the orcs and gnolls, and then show them that they don't have to cost others their own prosperity and turn the whole world against them to get it. Yort sat and listened and considered it. Thank you. He said at length, now far more at peace than he had begun the conversation at. How did you become so wise of words? Now it was Peregrine's turn to chuckle. How old are you again Yort? Seventeen, why? The young hobgoblin responded. 
I am well over 6 times older than you, and have most certainly made 60 times as many mistakes in the course of that long life my young friend. That is how I obtained wisdom, by fucking up over and over again for a very long time and learning from my mistakes. Among those mistakes, the halfling continued. Is staying up too late worrying. Go to sleep, Belisarius will keep an eye on us. Who's keeping an eye on him? Eor joked back. Bartholomew, now go to sleep or I will have him sit on you. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. I am the bard, who has borne witness to mighty empires, from Arkhosia to the Soviet Union, and know that all fall in time, yet none are forgotten. Eort and Peregrine rose the next day, having passed the night in peace. They woke before the dawn, ate a breakfast of bread and cheese, washed it down with clean water from a nearby stream, and set out once more. Just after the sun had properly risen, they heard the cry of a nightingale, too late for that fair bird to be awake and singing. They followed the sound, and were greeted by an elven scout, who dropped from the trees and offered a salute. The elven style of salute was to raise a hand to one's eyes and then gesture broadly towards the one being saluted. It is partly for this that elves have received a reputation for condescension, as their means of respect appears like human frustration. Still, Eort had grown mostly used to it, controlling his initial surge of dislike with knowledge. He answered with a stiff salute of his own clasping fist to breast and then raising it forwards and up at about a 45 degree angle. Report. Where is the legion, what are its numbers, and where is it moving? Eort asked the scout. The hobgoblins are about two and a half miles north by northwest of here, moving east and slightly south. There are about 1000 hobgoblins, a few hundred goblins, and some scattered bugbear elements, perhaps two and a half score. The elf reported sharply. Very good, return to Drake and feast in for rest and relief. Peregrine and I will take it from here. Eort ordered, and the elf balked. Apologies my lord. Legget. I am nobody's lord. Eort corrected. Continue. Ah, pardon my forwardness Legget, but you can't be serious. I am very keenly aware of you and Seer Peregrine's might in battle, but the two of you cannot hope to defeat an entire Hobgoblin Legion by yourself. Of course not. Eort responded with a confident grin that hit his own worries. I mean to recruit them. An extra thousand bodies would be greatly appreciated for the attack on the capital. Oh, of course. The elf said, remembering who exactly he was talking to. But. In the event negotiations should break down. In the event that they do, Peregrine and I are more than capable of cutting our way out. And I also have a flying horse faster than any mortal mount that never tires and can escape into the shadow fell if needed. That's without mentioning my illusions, invisibility, etc. The elf's ears turned slightly red as he realized how poorly he had judged the situation. He ought simply chuckled light-heartedly. They put me in charge of Rakom for a reason. I'll be fine, now go. If things go wrong, I want you as far away as possible to make sure you don't get caught up in the crossfire. We've lost too many good elves lately. I'd be loath to risk a single more. The elf nodded and got moving. Right. Eort said to Peregrine as the scout departed. Next step, find the army. Let's go. Together the two followed the elf's directions, navigating by the sun to find the hobgoblin army's position. 
while they didn't find the army itself, they did find the tracks, which weren't exactly hidden. Even the elves can't hide the passage of a thousand feet. They shadowed the army until nightfall, where it set to work creating the fortified encampment. Even still, Eort did not move up to speak with them. There is a certain code and courtesy to hobgoblin diplomacy, and to approach a fort still in construction would be an act of aggression. Peregrine, once I go in, I need you to stay back with Belisarius. Unless the whole camp comes against me, do not intervene. There will likely be some small combat, but you must remain and wait for my signal. Eort cautioned his mentor. You have a plan then I take it. Peregrine said with a smile as he saw the look of cool determination on his young friend's face. I always have a plan. Eort responded, then he swung down from his horse, landing without a whisper even in full plate. He walked towards the gate of the hobgoblin encampment. He came openly, not seeking to conceal his presence. The guards spotted him and made ready as he boldly approached, stepping from the shadows into the light. The torchlight struck his armor and it gleamed, the feathers of the great eagle upon his breast catching and turning the brilliant embers. The shining bronze that coated the hardest steel made him look as a companion of Aeneas. At his side was a mighty shield and a long blade of adamantine, and on his back javelins of silver make. The wind picked up and his long purple cape fluttered behind him, and his stern visage pierced through the guards. I am Legate Yort Imperator of the Alpha Legion. I have come to speak with your Legate on the most serious of terms. Stand aside. The young hobgoblin said, with force beyond his years and the authority of an emperor. The guards hesitated for a moment, then shook their heads. We cannot allow you passage, but we shall send a message to the Legate and see if he shall accept your request. This also was part of the ceremony. No man outside the Legion, not even the Emperor, could enter a camp without the approval of the Legate. There was a long moment, and neither guard nor paladin said anything as the messenger went and came back again. You may not enter. Instead, he is coming out to meet you. Coming out to meet you. In the same manner as which a force might sally out to strike at an encircling army. Eort answered this with a smile. Very well then. After a moment more, a banner bearer came forth and planted the standard in the ground. The legate Brutus of Legio Octavus. He announced, and the legate came. The legate was not an old man, there were very few old men in the legions these days, but he was not a young man anymore either. He looked to be in his mid-thirties, with shaven head and beard in the style of many military men. He was about Yort's height, and roughly his size as well, neither remarkable in height or breadth. He was clad in plate, but it was clearly very old, almost to the point of being archaic. Likewise, his weapon and shield, while freshly made, were anachronistic. At his side came two bodyguards in similar gear, and also a greying hobgoblin dressed in cleric's vestments and armor, bearing a great headsman's axe. Eort's face briefly flickered into a snarl of hatred, but it vanished as quickly as it came. Even still, the brief wave of fury that washed over the oncoming party was enough to give them pause. So then, are you the same Eort of Order Undivided I have heard about? Who formerly served under Cluny and then bit Raiden slew him? I am. Eort responded. Why have you come here? Brutus asked still very much on his guard. To ensure the reclamation of San Jonas by the forces of order. There was a hiss from between the legate's teeth. So, you have come to kill me then? No. I have come to enlist you. Eort responded. It was curious, he thought, to see a man twice his age look at him with fear. But it was also a credit to him that he came out despite the fear. Ah! And I see you wear the purple. You would make an emperor of yourself then? No, but I would make of our people an empire. We have an empire, albeit one much diminished. No. Eort answered. 
Klani was the last of the Imperial line, and the Iron Shadows have been destroyed, their records and their methods burned with them. The last breath of the corpse of the old Empire has finally been let out. At this the cleric and the guards gasped and took a step back. Eort continued. The Empire died 400 years ago Brutus. All that remained of it was a corpse we have wasted generations tearing pieces off of. Likewise, the men, the elves, the dwarves, all these have torn it away. That empire shall never return. What then? Have you just come to rub the vanity of our lives in our faces? Have your new friends among the elves and dwarves promised you some scraps from their table? Pieces of what is rightfully ours? No. I have come not to rebuild the old empire, but to forge a new one. Wiser and greater than before, an empire not merely of war but of order, one that stands as friend and comrade to the other civilized races as a bastion and bulwark against chaos, against the orc, the gnoll, the demon and the drow. This is heresy, blasphemy. The priest said, stepping forwards, but he ought sent him back on his heels with a glare. Is it so? Why then do you count the goblins and the bugbears among your ranks? Ah yes, slaves. That is what you will accept, slave who thinks he is master. Well hear this and no. The slaves of yesterday are our slaves no more. They rose, and for all your ilks preaching about our supposed superiority they tore our empire apart, and now even the legions are reduced to pit miners. He turned to Brutus. And you, surely you know the struggle and strife of keeping the Singulares as warriors. Of course, they despise and flee us, all we have ever done is use them as fodder. In the same way we treated all the peoples we conquered. It is our way, and the will of the conqueror. Brutus answered, but his words were hollow against truth. What has that brought us? What has our great creator brought us? Death, ruin, endless war and destruction. We are the sons of order, and yet all we find is war and chaos. All the world turned against us, every tribe, tongue, and nation looks upon us with the same hatred, we are as low as the orcs and gnolls in their eyes. Is that all we are worth? All we deserve? To fight endlessly, be hated by all beings, and then to die and engage in yet more war? Of course. The priest scoffed. We are the hobgoblins. There is only war. For what purpose? Eort shouted back, rage swelling to the surface. Why? Why do we fight? We build nothing, we leave behind ruins. Look and see, all the great creations of our people are from the age of the Republic, before the Conqueror, before the Emperors, before the endless war. We have nothing to fight for but the laughter of a thirsting God. Blasphemy. You dare to defy the will of our father? What kind of father brings nothing but suffering and servitude to his children? What parent demands their children make a stench of themselves unto the entire world? What parent tears their child away from things of creation and demands they destroy everything, even themselves? These are not the actions of a parent, but of a slave master. And as for me and my house, we will be slaves no longer. He ought return to Brutus. Go to St. Jonas with your legion alone, and it will be of no matter. Perhaps you will conquer it and reign for a time, but so long as you follow the mistakes of the past you shall be driven out. The old ways have failed us, now it is time to begin a new age for the hobgoblins. Not as sons of the tyrant, but as the sons of order. You have seen the hills of the city have you not? Come, join me, stand by the side of order undivided and together we will see a day when the hills are covered in the vines and orchards of our children. There will be a day when at last we will find peace for a time. There will always be war, we are hobgoblins after all, but it will be war with an end. There will be a place to rest, something to fight for. So that when the war is over, we will have something to come back to from the chaos. Come, help me make that future for our descendants, for us. If we continue to follow the past we will never escape it and we will have no future. 
the Empire is dead, and it is time to build a better one, for all our sakes. Eort's words pierced the legate, and for a moment he could see a visage of rest. He saw the great ruined city rebuilt, heard its chatter and bustle in the distance. He saw himself, old and grey, able to set down and rest under a blue sky on the balcony of his villa. He looked out and saw orchards of olives and citruses, and the vineyards of his children. His armor was set away, remembered fondly but able to be set down, or passed down to his son. In the distance, an aqueduct was being built, as they were in the ancient days of the Republic. It was as Peregrine had said. Order is graven on the hearts of all creatures, and war is chaos. It is in all sentient things to want to rest, to build and to grow. Wickedness and chaos buries this under lies of greed, of pride and wrath. But he ought spoke truth, and as light obliterates darkness the truth obliterates deception. It was a strange irony that the illusionist and backstabber should bear this power, but the world is full of ironies. After all, it was a bandit and a highwayman who had trusted a young hobgoblin of no note and taught him what he would need to become this. Brutus opened his mouth to answer Eort, but the cleric was first to speak. This is heresy. I will not permit IT. The priest roared in fury, spittle flying, his face purple with anger as he unleashed the power of the dark gods. Fire roared down from the heavens, orange and black light burning cities and smashed into Eort where he stood. The legate of the Alpha Legion vanished under the smoke and flame. No. Brutus roared as he whirled on the cleric, but he was too slow. The priest struck him in the side with the great axe and sent the legate sprawling across the ground with grievous wound. You! The cleric panted, foaming at the mouth with rage. You are no longer worthy to command this legion. By right of ancient law, I claim you command. That's just fine. The cleric whirled as the sound came from the pillar of fire, and the ought walked out. His adamantine shield was red hot from the flame, but he was otherwise unscathed. By my right as legate, I declare a challenge of conquest against you. I will have your office, legate. He said with a snarl. I accept. The cleric roared, and the two charged each other, axe ringing off the shield once, then again. Eort moved in to follow up, landing two narrow cuts along the priest's torso, the enchanted adamantine blade cutting through steel-like cloth. A spiritual axe flared to life in the priest's left hand and he swiped at Eort, forcing the young man back with a cut on his thigh. He struck again, chipping the axe on Eort's shield twice as the paladin moved in, dropping the shield and lashing out with his hidden dagger. He opened two long scratches on the cleric's face before driving him back with another torso blow from the long sword. As the priest reeled back under the onslaught he unleashed a blast of holy light. Eort slammed a foot down on the lip of his shield, flipping it up to block. Both Guiding Bolt and Mighty Shield rang out as they hit and went spiraling away. Eort took the chance, though and closed the distance. He caught a spirit axe on his long sword and moved in closer still, smashing the cleric in the face with the headbutt. Lightning flared as the priest fell back stunned, and the Oort drove his dagger into his ribs twice more, each time amplifying it with powerful electricity. The magic axe vanished and the priest swiped down, fire trailing along his hand. Eort dodged a moment too late and staggered as the flames scorched his face, momentarily blinding him. The cleric's axe bit into his shoulder and cast him back a step. His vision cleared just in time to see the priest making a familiar motion. Eort dove for his shield and got it above him just in time before the flame strike struck it again. The shield held, and the Oort tried to roll out of the flames when the fanatic dove in after him, bringing his axe down again and again on the adamantine shield. With a tremendous force of will, Eort expelled whatever he had in his lungs to blow away the smoke for a moment, then suck in a new breath. His chest burned as the superheated air scorched his lungs, but oxygen was oxygen. He rose with a roar, 
shattering the head of the axe as he forced the cleric back, then struck him in the face with the shield. The priest roared in pain as the hot metal smashed in his face and threw him out of the fire. He rose to strike again with what remained of his axe. Eort stepped out of the flames, batted aside the crude swipe, and then with a mighty blow cut off the hand holding the axe at the wrist. The cleric fell screaming, but not bleeding. The heat of the fire had transferred into the sword, instantly cauterizing the wound. Eort drove his blade into the earth, picking up the fallen remains of an axe and snapping it into two. He cast the pieces into the fire. The cleric, with the kind of power that only comes from fanatical madness, rose. Despite his injury, he launched himself at Eort, clasping his remaining hand around the paladin's throat, bearing them back into the fire. But Eort was not finished, even as they both burned, he raised his hand and broke the cleric's arm and hold with the sound of a thunderclap. Surrounded by the flames, he struck the priest in the face with mailed fists, over and over again. Until at last, he seized the cleric by the throat and side, lifted him over his head, and then brought him down. There was a crack of lightning and breaking bone as Eort snapped the priest's spine over his knee. Eort cast him aside, and strode through the fire once more, magic already attending to his many burns. A scream of rage and agony followed him. Eort retrieved his blade and went to the wounded legate. Offering him a hand up, he healed his wounds. Welcome, Legate Brutus of the Beta Legion. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.